Well, you see, a lot of people, uh, to my estimation, it's in them to do this, that, the other. Well, it was in me, I just loved the animal. It is one of the great untold stories in sports. A story that travels through the history of American thoroughbred racing like an underground river. It surfaces from spot to spot in springs that seem to appear from nowhere. At other times, it's hidden from sight. But in fact, it has shaped the entire landscape. And uh, I just wanted to be a trainer. I bred, I had 600 acres, and I done it all. African Americans are a constant presence in thoroughbred racing. As racing changes, and their status in society changes, African Americans take a place of prominence in jobs that range from jockey to trainer to groom. But they never disappear from the scene. When it's in you, you don't, all you got to do is be where it happens. That's all. Like many others, this story begins in Africa. In particular, the Niger Loop of West Africa, where traditions of horsemanship go back centuries before many of its people were captured and enslaved. Slaves were often captured and sold with an eye toward an individual's special talents, horsemanship among them. They were the least costly source of labor for the expensive, dirty, and sometimes dangerous work of keeping horses. So the subtle and refined craft of handling horses, both for racing and for transportation, continued to develop in the slave quarters and the plantation stables. When owners stopped riding their own horses and began using jockeys, Slaves were assigned that role. We know a few names. Cato, who won his freedom in an 1839 match race. Monkey Simon, reputed to have been a prince in his native Senegal. But before the Civil War, jockeys of any color were not considered as important as the horses, and their names were not listed in the racing program. Some slaves earned their freedom riding. Others parlayed their abilities as trainers into a level of affluence and independence unknown even to other skilled slaves. But the racetrack could also reveal how powerless a slave was. He or the plantation where he lived could be wagered and lost on a race. After the Civil War, Races changed from several three or four mile heats to the shorter distances run today, and the weight and skill of the jockey became much more important to winning. The newly freed African Americans, many of them is just barely into their teens, came to dominate the sport. Isaac Murphy was the greatest jockey of his century, maybe the greatest that ever lived. He won three Kentucky Derbies and many other races, even more prestigious at the time. He had such a profound sense of the horses he rode that he rarely resorted to the whip. And during a period when corruption was commonplace, his integrity was a byword. But Murphy was only the most famous of a great group of jockeys that included Alonzo Clayton, James Soup Perkins, Willie Sims, and James Winkfield. African-American Dudley Allen trained and owned horses, one which won the Derby. And Isaac Murphy and trainer Ed Brown were among the wealthiest and most socially prominent African Americans within the racing industry. Former jockey William Walker's encyclopedic knowledge of bloodlines made him a highly valued assistant to breeder John E. Madden. Their work together laid the foundation for the present-day American thoroughbred. 
After the turn of the century, however, fewer African-American jockeys rode on American tracks. Why did they seem to vanish? The rising status and recognition of jockeys came at the same time opportunities for them were decreasing. It was the Jim Crow era when discrimination against African Americans took many new and insidious forms. There were reports of conflicts between white and black jockeys at some tracks. Anti-gambling agitation caused many tracks to close. And as the licensing of jockeys came under centralized control, fewer African Americans were granted a license to ride. Racing also became more lucrative after Churchill Downs and other American tracks reintroduced paramutual wagering in 1908. Larger purses attracted European American jockeys, with fewer races being run this influx cut into African-American opportunities. In 1911, Jess Conley was the last African-American jockey to date to ride in the Kentucky Derby. Some jockeys continued riding on smaller Western tracks or in Europe and the Caribbean. Many more made careers as exercise riders or grooms. Something similar happened to trainers in the years following World War II. As the number and value of purses increased, the trainer's status rose, making a profession dominated by African Americans more attractive to European Americans. Before the Civil Rights era, many African Americans in racing encountered incidents of humiliating discrimination. When money gets into anything, me and you got to back up. It's just that simple. Big money in training. It was all black trainers, 90% then. You see, when the money gets good, you out. I'm out. African American trainers have never disappeared, as the successes of Sitgraves, Nate Cantrell, Oscar Dishman, Jacob Batchelor, Hank Allen, and others prove. And African Americans remained numerous in the unsung but vitally important roles of groom, hot walker, and exercise rider, the people devoted to keeping the horse in prime racing shape. African Americans were the foundation of thoroughbred racing some time ago as grooms, as trainers, as jockeys, and etc. And I happened to see and know a lot of people who were involved at the industry at that time. They took pride in the fact that they worked with horses. I think that those skills are inherited. I think people pass those skills down. The contributions of Africans toward the American side relative to horses have been very valuable. And the present day is the beginning of a new chapter in this long running story. We're not coming into the business to try to change uh, the tradition, the way that racing has always been. But uh, as owners, we look to really take charge of our stables. One of the changes is I think you're going to see that African Americans have begun, are going to get back into this game because there are a number of African Americans who can afford to get into this game. I think that it can reach the heights that it had some time ago I think that you're going to see a new reverence relative to African Americans involved in this industry. American thoroughbred racing has many creators, but few groups have brought more hard work and imagination to the task or set higher standards by their performance than African Americans and no one is building on a deeper or longer tradition. The underground river is still running and finding new places to break into the sunlight. <laughs>